Hi, welcome to Stories of Art. My name is Karel Huidekoper. Today we're going to have a look at this incredible painting by Johannes Vermeer. We call it The Artist in His Studio or The Art of Painting. These are modern titles that have been given to it. Vermeer never bothered giving titles to his paintings as far as we know. But before we get going, this is the time when I need to remind you to subscribe to my channel because I've noticed that fewer than a quarter of you actually subscribed up to now and for some reason it helps my channel if you do subscribe so please just press that little button below the video and hit the bell icon so you can get notifications whenever I post new videos and with that out of the way let's get started today Vermeer is regarded as one of the greatest masters of the Dutch Golden Age so it's kind of strange to imagine that he was all but forgotten for about a century and a half after his death which if I have to come up with a reason is because he was not from Amsterdam, um, he didn't sell much outside of his native Delft, and that in turn could have been the reason that we have no early biographies of him. You see, there are several books that were written um, by, mainly by painters. They collected these biographies of artists, and they were published at the end of the 17th century and the beginning of the 18th century. And in most of those, Vermeer was either hardly mentioned or not mentioned at all. But he was rediscovered halfway through the 19th century and over the past well, century and a half or so, more and more details about his life have been uncovered through archival evidence, but also through mentions of Vermeer in other people's diaries. And of course, simply by studying his work. So let me tell you what we now know about him. Well, he was born and raised in Delft, which nowadays is a smallish city in between The Hague and Rotterdam in the Netherlands. But at the time it was considered a normal sized town. It is in the province of Holland and that made it a wealthy town because Holland was the richest province in the Low Countries and it profited most from the Golden Age by far. Vermeer's father was called Reinier Janszoon and that last name simply means son of Jan and Jan is the Dutch way of saying John so it's basically Johnson. By the way, Johannes is also a Dutch version of the name John. But the father of Johannes Vermeer, called Reinier, was an innkeeper. He rented an inn called De Vliegende Vos, which means the flying fox. And he started to use the Dutch version of the word fox as his last name, so he was called Vos. And in his inn, he also had an art dealership. He bought and sold paintings. And apparently he did well, because at some point he bought his own inn, and that was on the main central town square. And he called his inn Mechelen. I suppose after the city in Flanders where the, the family probably originated. And there, again, he also sold art. And after he bought that inn, at some point he started calling himself Vermeer. You see, last names were not really fixed things yet. He was even a member of the Painters Guild of Delft. But not as a painter, but as an art dealer. And I tell you this because when he died, Johannes Vermeer, who had only just turned 20, inherited the inn and all the other business. He, Johannes, had not yet finished his education. That is, only a year later, he was named a master painter by the St. Lucas Guild in 1653. He got married to a Catholic woman called Caterina Bolnes, and therefore he had converted to Catholicism, which is unusual in the mainly Protestant area of Holland and they would eventually live with her mother, Maria Tins, in one house. And the couple would have 14 or perhaps even 15 children. 11 of those were still alive when Vermeer died at the age of 43 in 1676. And I always find that a particularly interesting detail. I mean, apart from feeling for his poor wife, but the scenes that Vermeer painted are so incredibly peaceful. They exhume this sort of serene silence, which is quite at odds with the household of over a dozen children. So it's sort of fun to realize that while he was making these quiet scenes, there must have been kids playing, arguing, screaming, yelling most of the time, just beyond the wall of his studio. Now, we don't know who he trained with. We don't know who his teachers were. Some people have been suggested, but only because they are of an older generation and happen to live in Delft. None of them seem to have any relationship to his style. There are, though, two people that clearly did influence Vermeer, and one of them is called Karel Fabricius, 
He had been a student of Rembrandt and moved to Delft and was there in 1650. At that time, Vermeer would have been in his last stages of his training and could well have spent some time working with Fabricius. The reason we think this is because he had a similar handling of light, especially when you look at what is arguably Fabricius' most famous work, known internationally as the Goldfinch, but in Dutch, het Pittertje. But we can be absolutely sure of another person who influenced Vermeer, and that is Pieter de Hoog. He was not a native of Delft, but came there in 1652 and started painting scenes of domestic life, the sort of thing we now call genre pictures. You know, scenes with a few people sitting around a table, drinking, smoking, playing cards. This is an excellent example. He usually set his scenes in a room where you could look out into another room with more spaces beyond. Just like in this one, you can see the courtyard, a corridor and a tree beyond. So that suggests that there's either a garden or a street there. In the 17th century, paintings like these were not called genre pictures. That's a much younger name. Instead, they were referred to as perspectives or perspectives, because obviously perspective plays a large role in these paintings. Now, Vermeer, beyond any doubt, saw the work of Peter de Hoog and vice versa. And also beyond any doubt, they influenced one another in the way they composed their pictures, they placed their figures and the way they use light, but also in subject matter. And of course, in the work of Vermeer, perspective also plays an important role, except that Vermeer used it in a much more subtle way, as we shall see. By the way, these days you could be forgiven for never having heard of Peter de Hoog, but he was much more famous during their lifetimes and directly after. You see, he did move to Amsterdam and he sold to a much larger and wider audience and he made a lot more paintings. So he was mentioned extensively in those books of artist biographies that I mentioned earlier. So even though pictures like these were not in fashion for a while, especially during the 18th century, he was never forgotten. And in fact, this painting by Vermeer was bought in 1813 by Johann Rudolf Count Zernin for the almost insultingly low price of 50 florins, but he bought it thinking it was by Peter de Hoog, because someone had forged his signature on the painting. And it wasn't until 1860 that the truth was revealed that this painting is by Vermeer. It was discovered that the signature of Peter de Hoog was a forgery because it was placed on top of a varnish that had to be removed. And that of course proves that the signature had been added much later. And they found the real signature, which is hidden in plain sight right here on the border of the map on the back wall which is an unusual way for Vermeer to sign his pictures. Usually he sort of muddled together his initials. But in the piecing together of his life, there is one question that remains unanswered, and that is how he actually made a living. You see, these days we have only 36 paintings that are ascribed to Vermeer. Six of those are contested. So if we are generous, there are about 33. Now, it's not unreasonable to say that half of his paintings have been lost through the years. Things happen, disasters, fires, floods, and in his case, probably also neglect, because he was forgotten and genre pictures were so very unfashionable in the 18th century. So many of them would be stored in attics or basements, which also makes it quite possible that, for that reason, more of them will turn up over time. So it might be worth it to check your attic. But even if we say that half of his paintings were lost, that still means that he would only have painted about 70 pictures in over 20 years. Now, that's not a lot, and probably not enough to live off, even if we know that he asked and received large sums for them. We know from a diary of an art lover who visited him in the 1660s that he wanted 600 livres for the painting. Now, those prices may not mean much to us today, but it places him amongst the most expensive painters of genre pictures in the entire century. Still, with only three or so pictures a year, that would not pay the bills, especially when you consider that he used very expensive materials. He used only the most expensive pigments. One of those is, of course, lapis lazuli, which he used extensively and not just in things that had to be colored blue, but also to give a bluish hue to some of his shadows. And that would add a considerable cost to his paintings, which means he made less money off of them. So it's quite likely that he also was an art dealer, like his father was before him, 
and maybe they still rented out that inn that his father had owned, but we can't be sure about that. We do know that his work was in demand. One particular collector was called Pieter Klaasson van Rijven. He owned at least 20 of his paintings, and several traveling art collectors mentioned visiting Vermeer to try and buy some of his work. One of them was Balthazar de Monconis. He was a French diplomat, and he mentioned that he was disappointed to see that Vermeer had no works in stock for him. So that means that he had sold everything that he had painted so far. It could also mean that he only worked on commission, but that is kind of unlikely because people rarely did that with genre pictures. But then that would also mean that he would have sold everything he had made. But it's possible, and perhaps even likely, that because of that particular complaint, and others like it, that he made this very painting. You see, today we think that this painting was made to show potential clients what he could do. It's a showpiece, an example of how excellent his work is. And we think that because it shows all his strengths. You can see how well he could paint figures, lighting, perspective, still life, all the sort of aspects that make him such an exceptional painter. Also, it shows him painting, which sounds like a good subject for that sort of thing. And the painting is quite big, much bigger than most of the other paintings he ever made. And we know he never sold it. It was one of the very few of his own paintings that he still had in his possession when he died. Now, even if we can't be entirely sure why he made this painting, we do see that comment by de Monconi as a way of dating this painting, because we know he held on to it. And that means it wasn't in his studio when de Monconi visited which was in 1665. So this painting must have been made somewhere after that. Now, let's have a closer look at the painting itself. Now, what is it that we see here? There's a painter in his studio working on a painting. And we see him from the back from a slight distance. That distance is made greater through the curtain and this chair that we see here in the front. That's a painterly device called a repoussoir. Uh, you place an object in the foreground and that will give a greater sense of depth. But it also helps to hide the window. In this case, she's standing away from the window, but that's of course the source of light. And through the curtain, it becomes a bit obscured. Note, by the way, that this is a heavy curtain and it's drawn back as if we see a scene on a stage and the curtain is sort of being drawn open. And the scene that is set before us at first glance may look kind of natural a painter at work with a model standing in front of him. But when we look closer, we see that this is not a literal scene of a painter at work. First of all, we see him in his Sunday best. He's wearing very expensive clothing and he's working with paint right above his white stockings. That doesn't seem like a smart thing to do. So he probably made it up to make himself look better or that is making the painter look better. And then there's this model. Painters in the 17th century used models sometimes. They used them for faces and facial expressions, or perhaps to try out poses. But if you ever posed for anything, you know that standing still for a long time is very uncomfortable. And therefore, for painters, it's not a good idea to have your model stand around for too long. And she's standing there holding two heavy things. One, a big book, and the other, this trumpet that she's holding in front of her. This is not a practical thing to do. You can't stand for an hour like that and still have an, that sort of angelical expression on your face. So in practice, you might ask a model to stand and pose for you for a short time so you can sketch out the beginning of the painting. And then you ask her to come back again when you want to finish and you want to place in the last sort of details. But she wouldn't be standing there for the entire duration of making the painting. I mean, Vermeer would take months to finish one. And if we look at what he's actually painting within the painting, you can see that he has sketched some of her outlines, but he's actually painting the details of the laurels on her head, something you don't need a model for at all. Now, all of that makes us think that this is not just a realistic depiction of a painter in a studio, but more of an allegory. And then it would be an allegory of the art of painting. And the fun thing is that we actually know that that's what he intended because his wife, or rather his widow, described the painting precisely that way after his death. She called it a painting of schilderkunst, 
which is a Dutch word for the art of painting. Now, what is an allegory? Literally, of course, it means saying something else. And you can do that in a painting using gods, angels, personifications. And personifications, in particular, were very popular things for artists to express, well, basically anything with. And there were books that detailed exactly how you could do that. By far the most popular was called Iconologia. It was written by Cesare Ripa, and he first published it in 1598, in Italy. But it was soon translated into various other languages and published everywhere. And a very popular edition was a Dutch translation published in 1644. This is the title page. It is a book that describes how to make personifications. In it you can read precisely what you have to do. Basically you take a person, preferably a woman, according to Ripa, and you give her attributes. And those attributes give it meaning. He described existing and often used personifications like, for instance, justice. In his description, that's a woman holding a sword and scales. And he gives a reason for having a sword and scales. That is, justice will be presented with different arguments. She can weigh them and make a decision. That's what you use the scales for. And then you enforce that decision with the sword. The point is there's always sort of a, a, a reasoning behind every attribute. And this is basically the reasoning behind Lady Justice. Now, we can take his book and simply look up a personification that matches with this girl. And as it turns out, she matches perfectly with the personification of history. And that just happens to also be the muse Cleo. I mean, Cleo is the muse of history, and she is also used as the personification of history. And according to Ripa, she is supposed to be depicted wearing laurels, and she holds a book or a scroll and a trumpet. Because Cleo is called the proclaimer, the glorifier, and the celebrator of history, she celebrates great deeds and accomplishments, and her trumpet is often referred to as a trumpet of fame. So it's quite likely that that is exactly what Vermeer tried to convey here, because it fits perfectly with what we see. So in this case, that would mean that she helps to proclaim the great deeds and accomplishments within painting. Also, it was often said that history is the mother of painting. And then there's also that table that is, I think, intended to be next to the painter rather than right next to the model. And on it, we can see the sort of things that painters need. That is, books, drawings, and what I think is a plaster cast of an ancient sculpture. At least, the face of one. And a painter needs books because painters love to stress that painting is an intellectual pursuit, not a craft. Meaning, that is something you do with your head rather than something you do with your hands. But you also need to study ancient examples, like the plaster cast. And of course, you need to study, and that's why the, there's a sketchbook there. But it also gave him the opportunity to paint several different fabrics and show that he could do that. All of these things are there to show off what he could do to a potential buyer. So he would know what to expect if he ordered a painting from Vermeer. Now, there's another aspect to this painting that isn't immediately obvious, and that's the perspective. Vermeer was always very careful about how he constructed the spaces that he painted. And we can reconstruct what he did by following the lines of the tiles on the floor. If we were to extend those lines, you would find that they converge somewhere beyond the picture frame. Now you can do that on the left and on the right. And you would find that they would converge exactly at the same height. And that height, there's a line and it's called the horizon. And the precise point exactly between these two converging points, that is the vanishing point. And that point we can logically reconstruct must be just below the ball at the end of the rod of the map on the back wall, the one below the model's hand. Now we know that because we can reconstruct it but it has been confirmed in every restoration that has been performed on it, because right at that place, where we expect there to be a vanishing point, there is a pinhole. And that means that when Vermeer was setting up his picture, he placed a pin there and tied a string to it. And he used that string to place all the various lines he needed to construct his picture. And this is a very traditional way of doing things, and you would expect to find that. But it's surprising to see the placement of the vanishing point, which is not in the center of the picture, but there, sort of off to the left. 
it is almost where the painter in the painting is looking. And it sort of subconsciously draws our eyes to that point. Now, I know there's always been a discussion about Vermeer using a camera obscura to set up his pictures. And it's quite possible that he did, but quite often people think that he used such a device to help him with his perspective. And that he very definitely did not do. Certainly not in this picture, because we have the pinhole and we know how he did it. But also not in other pictures, because that's just not how you use a camera obscura. It's not what you use it for, that is. Now I'm working on a different video on linear perspective and how it was used by painters historically. And I'll put the link in the description of this one as soon as I'm done with it, because there I can explain in much more detail how this works. But let's get back to our picture and have a look at the map in the background. That is a map that actually existed. It was made by a map maker called Klaas Jansson Visser. And we can see the same map on paintings by other painters as well. For instance, this one. There's a slight difference though. With Vermeer, there's the addition of 20 pictures on the sides, which are depictions of the 20 most prominent cities. And you can also see there's a uh, legenda at the bottom. Now, to modern viewers, it's difficult to recognize the map because it's on its side for our idea. Because the north, in this case, points to the right. Um, having maps oriented to the north at the top wasn't a thing yet, or it wasn't standardized yet. In this case, the top of the painting is the west. So it seems that you look at the Low Countries on its side with the North Sea at the top. But what is remarkable is that it's not just a map of the Netherlands, but one of the 17 provinces of the Low Countries. That is what is today the countries of the Netherlands, modern day Belgium, and I think even Luxembourg. All these lands had once been combined and ruled by, well, first the Burgundies and then the Habsburger. But the North had revolted and fought a long war of independence and that war had ended some 20 years before this painting was made. Now, that is not really remarkable because this map simply existed and why not have it on your wall? But what is remarkable is that there are two creases in it. One very prominent and one a little less. That's the one just to the left of the big one. And you have to realize that there's no reason for that crease to be there. You see, a map like this one, you would roll it up. You would use the rods that are at the top and the bottom to simply roll it. And when those rods are there, you couldn't even fold it. So it's hard to imagine how a crease would get there. And that's why many people have speculated that there's a specific reason for it. And it has been argued that that crease, on the right at least, follows roughly the separation or the border between the north and the south of the Low Countries, which now would be roughly the border between the Netherlands and Belgium. And the area between the two creases contains several places that originally wanted to belong to the north, but after the 80-year war were still held by the Spanish. And that might sound convincing, but the trouble is these creases only vaguely follow these lines. They're not precise. So I'm not entirely convinced that this is the real meaning of these creases, or that indeed there's a meaning to these creases at all. And then there's this one little detail that I should mention as well, and that's the chandelier. If we zoom in on it, it seems to have these this sort of two-headed eagle on it. And that just happens to be the family crest of the Habsburger. But it could be that this is just a decorative pattern and it's not intended to be a double-headed eagle. But it does look like it. And if so, would there be some sort of political meaning behind that? I mean, that is the family that ruled all of the Netherlands before the War of Independence. And the truth is, there again, we just don't know. It could be. But some have argued it's not a double-headed eagle at all, it's simply a decorative pattern. So we can't be sure. But there was one owner in the history of this painting who very much liked to claim that it did mean something. And that was Adolf Hitler. You see, after Vermeer died, his wife, or widow I should say, tried to hold on to the painting, even though they needed to sell it to settle some of the debts that they were in. Which by the way is one of the reasons we can argue that this was his favorite painting. But after she died, it was most likely sold by her children. We don't know to whom. And as I said, it turned up again only in 1813, when it was sold to Johann Rudolf Kahn Schenen. His family, or descendants, 
still owned it in 1940 when they sold it to Hitler because he wanted to put it in his museum in Linz that he had planned but which never materialized. In the meantime it was stored in Munich but taken to one of those salt mines for safekeeping at a later stage where it was discovered by that American army unit known as the Monuments Men. One of whom actually took it on a train to Vienna and he apparently had to lock himself in a, a compartment for the ride. He brought it to the Austrian authorities and they placed it in the Kunsthistorisches Museum where it still is today. By the way, the descendants of the Chanin family still contest the ownership of the painting, claiming that they were forced to sell it. But so far, several independent courts have decided that they were paid fairly for it. But if you check the website of the museum, you will see that they are quite open about the artwork in their collection and the status of the various ownership claims that sometimes still arise. But for now, Vienna is the place to see this painting. But before you head over there, please hit the like button and of course the subscribe button if you haven't already. And I'd like to thank you very much for watching and hope to see you again soon. Bye.